Welcome to Excerpts from the Open Forum. On this program, we'll hear Mr. Harold Camping answering pre-recorded questions regarding issues from the Bible. Here's our first question. Uh, my question is related to uh, 1 John 3, uh, verse 6. 1 John short... 3, verse 6? Mm-hmm. Let's look at that. 1 John 3... Verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Is that what your question is? Yeah, it, I, I was looking at the uh, NIV translation, which I know you don't appreciate, but um, it leads me to believe as a Christian that we're not supposed to sin any longer. And, and it's very difficult to, uh, I mean, of course, consciously we can make decisions in our lives to not sin and, and try our hardest and ask God for forgiveness. So my concern is, what about sins that we aren't even aware of? Well, first of all, uh, the, the further definition of uh, the verse you're looking at is found in verse 9, 1 John 3, verse 9. Whatsoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now, when we became saved, in our soul or spirit essence, we became a new creature in Christ. We were born again. We have a brand new resurrected soul in which we will never sin. Uh, uh, our, that's where our salvation has, uh, has occurred. But we still live in a body. And that's an integral part of our personality that has not become saved. That is why we long for the time when Christ comes, then we're going to receive our brand new resurrected body so that uh, then neither in body or soul will we ever want to sin again. But as long as we live on in this side of the grave uh, or this side of Christ's return, we, uh, in our soul, we never will sin again, but in our body, the potential for sin is there. That's why uh, Abraham could fall into a sin. That's why David could fall into a sin, or Moses could fall into a sin, and so on. It doesn't mean that we're going to sin like we ever did before we were saved. There's a huge change in our life, but yet the potential to sin is there. That's why we read in Romans chapter 7, where God says that, uh, uh, with, uh, that uh, uh, in, my, in my mind I serve the law of, of God, but in my members there is another law at work that's in my body. And then it cry, at the end of the chapter it says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Because that's where sin is always trying to in just a little bit of a of a of a hold all right now but now i i think i've become saved let's start with the practicality of all of this i think i've become saved yet there are some vexing things in my life that have always been there to some degree and they still remain there there are certain lusts that i can't seem to get rid of uh, there are certain practices that i uh, or habits that I fall into that I know are not good. They're sinful and makes me feel bad all the time. Uh, have I, am I truly saved? And that's a fair question because maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm just hoping I'm saved. Maybe I'm just, uh, want to put the best face on it. Yes, I am saved. I can tell you this for sure that if you look at your life before you were saved, and your life now, there has to be, uh, when you have truly become saved, there has to be a very great difference, a very great difference. That is simply because before you were saved, both in body and soul, you lusted after sin. You, you were number one. Uh, you, uh, uh, you were thinking only primarily of yourself. And, and now that you have become saved, because you have a new resurrected soul that never wants to sin, uh, Christ has become all important. Uh, you are walking way more, you are, uh, way more humbly. You are uh, recognizing that any good in you is only because of the blessing of God. 
Uh, you're not taking credit to yourself all the time for how good you are. You are simply uh, recognizing that uh, that uh, any goodness I have, I have to give all uh, God all the credit. And there's just and sin has become vastly more abhorrent to you than it was before. Now, if that big change hasn't occurred, if you can't sense that in your life, then it means you may not be saved as yet. Now, wonderfully, we're living in a day when God is saving a great multitude. The Bible promises that. It is the day of salvation, only it's not happening in the local congregations. You must be outside of that because that's where God is working and and so the potential to become saved is, is as great as it ever has been. So, quick question. Yes. The the other part is um, I've read through the New Testament, studied it very closely as as, as much as I can the last past two years, and I'm starting to look at the Old Testament, and I'm having a hard time understanding where Jesus upholds certain laws and where some of the laws are ritual, and how as a man. You can distinguish the difference. Well, any laws that where you have to do something uh, uh, in order to uh, identify with salvation, that is ritual. That is a ceremonial law. Like uh, there were sin offerings. You have to bring a lamb or bring uh, some kind of an offering uh, uh, or a blood sacrifice of some kind. That was a ritual. That was a ceremonial okay. law. Then I misspoke, but what I meant was like not eating shellfish, not eating bird of prey, um, things things that are like not eating pork or ham. That's all ritual, all ritual. What in the world would not eating pork or ham have to do with salvation? Okay, it, it, it is a figure of speech that is pointing to an aspect of salvation, but it's not anything that is uh, identified with salvation. And, and uh, uh, that's why in the New Testament, God indicates that those kind of laws were shadows of things to come. And the thing to come, it, it was all focused on the Lord Jesus. In the New Testament time, there, are only, there were only two uh, ceremonial laws that God enjoined. And they were to be observed throughout the church age. One was water baptism, and the other was the Lord's table. But uh, there are no other ceremonial laws that we have to follow. Hi, Brother Campy. Yeah. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, could you read um, John chapter 20, verse 5 through 7? John 5, verse 5, 6, and 7. And he's stooping down, and now... Uh, Jesus has just arisen, uh, and and uh, J Jesus has just arisen. The tomb is empty, and uh, Peter and John run to the tube to tomb to see. Uh, they've heard that it is empty, and so they ran together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter. And the and the uh, implication of the of the context is it was uh, John, the other one, the other apostle. And he came first to the sepulcher, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Now, Jesus was wrapped in, uh, in linen uh, windings, and there was a napkin that had been, uh, a separate napkin that had been placed on his head. Then uh, cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and see it, the linen clothes, clothes lying, lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Now, what is your question? Well, I was wondering if um, there's any significance between the clothes and the napkin being in two different places. Well, I, I, I don't know what the significance is uh, altogether, but I do. Uh, we, uh, we at least can, can see some, uh, some uh, truths here. First of all, this was not a situation where somebody had taken the body of Jesus and, uh, in order to put it some other place. The, mm -hmm. Then the clothes would have still been around Jesus. Maybe the napkin would have fallen off 
on the uh, on the floor of the sepulcher. But it's uh, the clothes are very carefully laid in one place, the napkin in another. In other words, this is a very very uh, uh, deliberate uh, and carefully planned uh, uh, situation uh, because uh, Jesus has arisen. So it's Second, not like. Secondly, God, of course, knows the end from the beginning. Now, for example, in our day, there has been a, a, uh, uh, an effort to uh, try to get call attention to a certain church, and they say they have found a burial garment that was wrapped around Jesus, they, uh, and, uh, and uh, they claim that uh, this... Uh, the face of Jesus can be seen on this burial garment, and so on, and so on. And yet, the language of the Bible clearly demonstrates that that whole business is a farce. It is all a fake, because uh, the uh, God, Jesus was not wrapped in a garment that covered his face. He had clothes around his body, and he had a napkin on his head as a separate gar a piece of uh, material. And so there could, even if they had never ch checked that uh, that uh, uh, burial uh, 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 cloth that they had found by carbon 14, they found out that it's only about a thousand years old instead of two thousand years old, which would be required if it had been wrapped around Jesus. But long before that, they should have known. No, it's no possibility, because the 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 uh, wrapping around Jesus was two parts, not one part. Right. But now there may be other other reasons, but the why God has said it this way. But that's as much as I know right now. I have uh, two questions. I mean, two subjects I'd like to talk to you about. Yes. Okay. Uh, first one. Can you bring up? Psalm 9, verse 18. Psalm 9, verse 18. Let's look at that. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Uh, yeah, the, in this context, I believe the needy and the poor are speaking about those who are are the ones that are going to become saved. They are spiritually needy, and uh, they are sp spiritually poor. Remember, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, and uh, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, these are the ones that are the needy and the poor. They, they uh, uh, before were saved, uh, were under the wrath of God, but then we become saved and we're rescued from be that verse without the italicized word. Uh, well, the italicized, let's, let's do that. Uh, the wicked shall be turned into... No, no. verse 18. Oh, verse 18. Uh, for the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall perish forever. Arise, O Lord, not, not man prevail. Yeah, now... Apparently, there's a problem there in the, in uh, in understanding the Hebrew, and and the translators uh, thought that it would be best to put the word "not" there. Uh, they had some basis for that, but I have never looked at this verse, so I don't know. I I, I see why you call about this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, certainly, the word if it's not in the original, then uh, we shouldn't try to put it in there, and. Uh, it, it may have some very difficult Hebrew as to how to understand it. So I, I, I have not worked on this verse, and I can't help you with it. You are listening to excerpts from the Open Forum on Family Radio. Mr. Harold Camping is answering pre-recorded questions about the Bible. If you'd like to hear more of Mr. Camping's teaching, you can hear and even download Open Forum broadcasts, Bible studies, and more. Just go to FamilyRadio.com and click on Audio Archives. Let's continue now with another question. Um, I had a question uh, in regards to um, John 3.16. Yes. And I guess with the question of uh, free will 
if we can ask God for forgiveness for our salvation, or does he just um, uh, basically save the elect? Well, um, see, the problem is when we read John 3.16, we make an assumption, ordinarily we do, an assumption that God has paid for the sins of everybody, and now it's finally up to me to decide whether I want to become saved or not. So we read John 3.16, For God so loved the world that whoso, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him. Oh, I see. If I decide to believe on him, then I will not perish, but I will be given eternal life. That's the way we read it. But our assumptions are all incorrect. We have to start out with the biblical uh, fact, namely that we're all dead in sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him, but there's nobody, nobody who wants to believe on him. There's nobody who seeks after him. We're a, a, a world of dead corpses. We're a a valley of dry bones, to use the figure that God himself sets forth in Ezekiel 37. So uh, the only way that verse can come to life is if we recognize that amidst these dry bones uh, in this uh, graveyard that the world is, this valley of death, God does save this one and that one. And when he saves us, we have come to believe on him. So that uh, if we're going to look at that verse and, in, and include the information from the rest of the Bible, we could paraphrase it this way. For God so loved the world that whosoever God saves so that they believe on him will not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, um, I guess my my question was um, coming to terms with that we really are dead. And um, even when he does say that, you know, uh, he comes to our hearts and he knocks at our door um, open to him. But how can we open that door to him unless he calls us? Or unless he, unless he gives us life. To, and he gives to, us life. So we're able to open the door. Right. You see, and, and you, the idea that we are spiritually a corpse is repugnant to us at first altogether because uh, you mean I'm a, uh, I, I have no, uh, tr no control over my life in this area at all? You mean I have to think of myself as a stinking corpse? Uh, I, I don't like that a bit. I don't want to think like that. Uh, and But the, the fact is, uh, God says, A broken and a contrite heart I will not despise. God is the one, as he saves us, takes and, and helps us to recognize our deadness. And right with that, he also recognizes we, we, uh, uh, we are given spiritual life so that we are, uh, do, uh, do begin to tr uh, believe on him, to trust him in a in a way that indicates we have become saved. Right, and I guess my only question is that a lot of times when I do have conversations um, with other people, um, it's really hard um, to explain it to them from that perspective. They feel that it isn't fair that some can be chosen by God and others um, cannot be, that we have no will of our own. Well, you see, the, the problem is that that we're trying to put God on trial. But the fact is, it amazes me that God saved any one of us. Right. Which of the human race deserves salvation? Which one? No one. No one. And the fact that God elected to save uh, this one or that one, that's God's business if he wants to do that. And you know when he elected a person, he also took upon himself an enormous task because it meant that God himself had to take the sins of that person upon himself, and he did so in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he had to be found guilty with all those sins because they are very real sins. So it's a big deal, a big deal, when uh, Christ decided to save this one or that one 
and yet none of us are deserving of that and uh, so we have to start with the fact that uh, how is it possible that God would save anyone and uh, and uh, the fact that maybe I can become saved it's it's a dream it's a dream and yet that is the possibility a great possibility uh, because uh, I could be one of God's elect just as quickly as someone else. Well, I thank you so much for your answer. May thank the Lord continue to bless you. Brother Campy, um, in Matthew sixteen eighteen, you can turn to Matthew sixteen verse eighteen. There, let's look at that. That's that passage that has to do, I will build uh, uh, my church. Uh, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, what is your question? Now, during the time when Jesus was speaking with the disciples, and he sat opposite from the temple, knowing that, the synagogue, they were supposed to, through the prophets, were supposed to, um, they were supposed to foresee that the Messiah was going to be coming to save us. And when Jesus had those 12 disciples, those were the first elect that he had right there where they were going to go out to preach the gospel all around this earth. They were the first church right then and there. And we read in Revelation about those seven churches. What Jesus was talking about when he when he said that upon this rock I'll build my church, that church still exists today, does it? Well, I I you were, you see it depends on what church we're talking because, about. Because see Jesus. Well, now excuse me. Now excuse me. Now you mentioned the seven churches of Revelation two and three. They have not existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. For uh, they're. For over a thousand years, the land of Turkey, where they were located, was without any true gospel of any kind. And those seven churches have long, long ago disappeared. So when Jesus is saying, I will build my church, it had nothing to do with, the, with those seven churches, except that within those churches, there were some true believers and the true believers, they are the church that Christ came to build, and, and they are safe from hell. The gates of hell cannot have them. Once we become saved, then we're eternally a citizen of the kingdom of God. But, but that, that, the, the, those who are eternally saved are at any time in history may have only been a very tiny part of the local congregation. Brother Campy? Yes. But in the Bible, if everything is Scripture to Scripture, and we go by what the Scriptures say in this Bible, then it must still exist today, those churches, because what? in the back of the Bible say if you add anything to the Bible and you take away, it shouldn't be then the churches still must be existing because if he said, if everything is complete from the old to the well, new. But you see, the, your, the problem is you read a verse and you say, well, this is what it means, and you're sure that you have the meaning of it. But, uh, but uh, how can you know whether you've uh, got the right meaning? I, uh, uh, you have to check your conclusion against everything else the Bible teaches. And the Bible has all kinds of things to say that he's not talking about local congregations here. Uh, the Bible uh, has warned again and again, even in Revelation 2 and 3, that those churches would disappear uh, already, already before the Bible was completed. The church at Sardis was already a dead church. God says so. And so you, we better read that. But you know... Uh, you can, there are people, you know, they pick a few verses and they say, well, it's obvious what these verses are saying. And so I'm going to believe the Bible and that's the end of the matter. Well, what they're doing is believing what they think those verses are saying. They're not, they're not obeying what the Bible tells us to do. 
the Bible commands us to compare spiritual things with spiritual. In other words, we have to check out our conclusions with anything and everything the Bible might offer. And so you can get very excited and uh, very uh, uh, con confident that, uh, that your conclusion is correct, but if it won't stand the scrutiny of the rest of the Bible, it can be just as false as anything else.